studying the early Buddhist art and the forms that it took, one of our most important surviving examples is the great stupa at Sanshi, which was begun by Ashoka to house a portion of the ashes of the Buddha. So a society where cremation is the practice after death. And we're going to talk about how those ashes then get put in a stupa. So Sanchi is the place where this stupa right here is sited, surrounded by the landscape and what was originally a monastic complex. Let's talk about the stupa as a form. It has a function. It's a reliquary. So it's a container for ashes, remains of someone revered. And it can be either massive, as the great stupa at Sanchi is, or it can be small, seven inches high. Here's a stupa from the region known as Gandhara that we'll be talking about, which is in the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco from around 100 BCE. Very small, can hold it in your hands. This is monumental and massive. It is a grand statement because it is understood to hold part of the ashes, the remains of the Buddha himself. So it belongs in the world cultural traditions of monuments and monumentality, which I define here for you. A monument noun, a statue building or other structure. So something significantly large and durable, erected to commemorate a famous or notable person or event. And monumental suggests both in greatness in importance, but also literally in size. The idea of scale and size and importance are all fused together in monuments like Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial, like the Egyptian pyramids, like Stonehenge. Notice they're all made of stone because their job is to commemorate, to withstand the passage of time and commemorate for the future something that should not be forgotten. So the great stupa is profoundly layered and deeply considered in its form, the way it uses space to create a sacred space, the way it uses symbols, and the way it invites rituals. What have we got here in terms of literal form? We've got this round dome hemisphere, a mound, a sacred dome or artificial hill with a staircase so that you can walk around it, you can circumambulate in a kind of walking meditation. And that rounded form evokes what is understood as the world mountain, the cosmos likened to a mountain. It's faced with stone, with shell, and covered with stucco. It was once very bright, although it doesn't look that way in photos anymore, it has faded. It was even once partly gilded gold leaf on certain parts. At the very top, you have this three-level vertical structure which resembles a stacked umbrella. And it evokes the idea in Buddhism of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, the community, the Buddha, the teacher, the Dharma, the teachings, the community the th of practitioners as sort of the sacred refuges. And so it also looks like an umbrella because it's shade that as if you were holding an umbrella to shade the Buddha's ashes, to symbolically shade the Buddha himself. That's what's traditionally done in the hot climate of South Asia, is that a king or other revered person would be kind of would have the followers and admirers holding an umbrella to shade that person. This isn't really architecture, it's sculpture. Even though you go in it, it's sculpted solid form and it's meant to be a cosmic diagram, which is called a mandala. A mandala is, can be, take many different um, appearances. It can be painted or it can be sculpted, but it is understood to be a symbolic distillation of how the cosmos is put together. And so this mandala has four toranas, gateways, into the sacred space, the four cardinal directions. Oops, got ahead of myself. It's also covered in amazing stone sculpture. So those toranas 
are not toranas are not just functional gateways they are elaborate elaborated complex and they are just just completely packed with amazing sculptures that were donated by ordinary local people so ashoka may have initiated this project but the, by the time you get the sculptures made for the gateways ordinary people are showing their devotion to the teachings of the buddha by paying for carvings to go on this sacred sculpture so this is actually collective patronage of ordinary people rather than the patronage of a king as we saw with the buddha so these are interesting because they're made out of stone but they actually mimic the kind of wooden architecture that would be used in everyday architecture it's the translation of of wooden um, impermanent uh, transient materials into a more durable material that evokes permanence which actually is what they did at stonehenge as well so these actually have bracket figures because if you were building with wood you would use brackets to support these figures you don't actually need brackets when you're building with stone but these bracket figures become an extravaganza of sculptures that are meant to signify exuberant abundance and joyful life so they use to do that this famous figure of the the yakshi which is an very ancient figure in south asian culture in which a a, a woman is seen with a tree and she's usually very bodaciously curvy with really ample breasts as if to signify mother earth's ability to breastfeed the entire cosmos the entire world itself so she has this quality of having a life-giving body which is what these she is conveying and she's also here stomping her foot on a tree because the ancient south asian myth of the yakshi is that she the stamp of her foot on the tree when she's dancing and smiling causes the tree to blossom so trees we know are evoke the buddha the bodhi tree trees are also really very widespread in the ancient world one of the most ancient common widespread symbols symbolizing the tree of life so there's a life-giving quality to the yakshi's presence at the great stupa of sanshi in addition to the yakshi we also have scenes that tell stories from the life of the buddha so one of the famous scenes is the great departure which is the time when siddhartha left the palace to seek spiritual awakening and so this is very interesting because if you look closely you can see there's the horse that transports the buddha from the palace but where's buddha there's the bodhi tree where he sits and meditates but where's buddha and then here's the scene where buddha dismounts from his horse to leave behind all of his um, luxuries and privileges as a prince and to become a renunciate and here's his servant bowing down before him where's buddha we get his footprints because at this point in buddhism there is an avoiding of figurative representations of the buddha they are practicing what we call an iconism which means avoiding a picture of the sacred figure so the buddha here is present in the story through the key symbols of the Bodhi tree, of the footprints, such a great symbol, you know, his footprints that he walked the path and we can find his footprints. And also often of the umbrella, the umbrella held up above the horse signifying shading the great figure. So this is also interesting in that it is a continuous narrative. It's not going left to right or right to left. It's combining stories at different time points using the bodhi tree as a central axis so you bounce around when you follow the story taking a moment to analyze the style look at the figures look at them they are very stocky and solid they are not like that elegant horse uh, not horse lion on the lion capital with that perfectly stylized coiffed 
mane. These are very cartoonish figures. They have kind of like big bellies and they are sort of humble looking because they are they are produced for real people who are paying for this. This is an art that is meant to speak not for and of the kings or the gods, but of the ordinary people who celebrate the Buddha. So in turn, it is just absolutely packed full, the compositional space. Look at that. There's no breathing room. It's wonderful. They've jammed every possible figure in there that they can to give it a sense of active bustle, which conveys this sort of enthusiastic sense of joyful participation as if everyone is celebrating together in this event that is sort of recorded, remembered, and honored at the great stupa.